Good, good afternoon. Uh, I thought we'd go ahead and get started here with the uh, presentation. It's always a pleasure to have Lazo Vara come and uh, do presentations on the work he's been doing at the IEA. The last time he was here was for the uh, first edition of their uh, medium-term coal market report, and I think it had a lot of insights that uh, we've all carried forward with us. The gas market report comes, of course, at a very interesting time for the U.S. as we're looking at what's the role we're going to be playing in international markets. Uh, a lot of political decisions being there, made there, a lot of statements being made about how those markets will operate. So I think the information Laszlo will give us will be quite helpful to understand that better. So Laszlo, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here. The uh, new uh, IE Gas Outlook was launched uh, last Thursday by, the, by our executive director in the St. Petersburg Forum uh, in, a very, in a very important gas country. Uh, and this is the first uh, uh, public presentation uh, of the new report just a couple of days after in another very important uh, gas country, the United States. So I'm very, I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to be with you. Now, uh, the, the big picture outline is that two years ago, uh, we, we introduced the concept of natural gas uh, entering a golden age. This is the golden age of gas. Uh, and two years later, we see no reason to go back uh, on this projection. We see natural gas growing at roughly 100 billion cubic meters per, uh, per year. I have to apologize from uh, our uh, American friends, the majority in the audience. Uh, as, a, uh, as a European, I, I, I think instinctively in, the metric, in metric terms. Uh, so the so natural gas is growing at roughly 100 billion cubic meters a year. So in, in five years, uh, the global natural gas system adds almost a Russia uh, so the, to it. Uh, the, uh, and we also see natural gas continue to grow considerably faster uh, than overall energy consumption. So natural gas increases its share in the global energy mix and much faster than oil. And we see... Uh, we see a very important physical substitution from oil to gas in two quite interesting places. Uh, one, the power generation sector in the Middle East. You know, oil is gone from power gener generation in the United States and Europe, but oil-fired power generation is very much part of the energy reality in the Middle East. Uh, and we see several important Middle Eastern countries pushing heavily uh, to replace that oil with natural gas. And the other is that natural gas is emerging as a credible major transportation fuel. So uh, comparing our gas and oil projections, the medium term growth of oil demand is around 106 million barrels per day lower uh, than uh, uh, as if this shift from oil to gas did not take place. And this is roughly half-half between power generation in the Middle East and transportation uh, in the United States and in some other countries. Having said that, we actually revised our projections downward uh, compared to the previous report uh, by roughly 70 billion cubic meters in a five-year time horizon uh, because of two things. One is the persistent weakness uh, in Europe where the combination of the Eurozone crisis uh, and uh, renewable policies constrained gas demand. And on the supply side, the biggest revision is uh, in the Middle East, uh, where the uh, outside Qatar, most Middle Eastern countries have an almost infinite abundance of gas underground and a gas shortage overground uh, so because of the uh, insufficient policies to get upstream investment going. Uh, so. Uh, so there is actually a negative revision into very important regions. But there is no negative revision for the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we, uh, as time is going by, we are gradually becoming more, more and more optimistic uh, about upstream uh, in North America. Uh, so what we see is that the growth of, uh, of shale gas production in the United States is uh, remarkably resilient uh, to low gas prices, uh, mainly because of three uh, main factors. One is that we see uh, uh, we see a very promising technological development uh, on the fundamental technologies of non-conventional gas, 3D seismic drilling and uh, and fracturing. Uh, in the heroic days uh, of the shale gas industry in 2006, 2007, 2008, the industry quite uh, to a quite large extent relied on brute force of drilling and fracking everywhere. Uh, so in the early shale gas areas, you had a long tail of 
shale gas wells, which contributed very little uh, to overall uh, production. Uh, whereas the, the industry is increasingly smart uh, in having a much better 3D seismic, much better uh, directional drilling, uh, a much better targeting of the fracking zones, uh, and also multi-bed drilling to, to reduce the surface uh, impact. Uh, all of this leads to, to a fundamentally better cost efficiency. Uh, very importantly, and a very big, uh, a very big uh, contrast to the rest of the world uh, is uh, the the supply capabilities of the oil field service companies uh, in the United States. The United States has roughly 75% of the global oil field service capabilities. And in my experience, the, there's a lot of observers in the United States and outside the United States underestimate the big capability gap of how good the oil field service industry in the United States is. Uh, so, uh, so the oil field service uh, industry in the big North American share plays uh, increasingly relies on, on mass manufacturing methods. Uh, some of the oil field service companies are actually using the same optimization software, which was originally developed for low budget airlines, who fly the same aircraft as the conventional airlines, uh, but with a fraction of cost because of the very efficient utilization of equipment. Because for shale gas, you don't simply have to drill and frack, you have to drill and frack thousand and thousand and thousand times. Uh, so a very efficient, high utilization of the drilling and fracking, fracking equipment is essential. In Poland, there was an interesting case last year when a big capacity modern drilling rig was standing in the Danzig Harbor for several months uh, before the companies could figure out where to go and what project to do. Now, of course, that will, that will very much have an impact uh, on, on costs. And last but not least, uh, the, the upstream industry in the United States proved to be very good at redirecting drilling activity into liquid-rich uh, and oil-rich areas. But this is not black and white from an upstream perspective, so you don't switch off gas to switch on oil. There's different shades of gray. So we have a very large-scale gas production in the United States supported financially by the liquids. In fact, last year, the group of companies whom we call U.S. gas industry received less than half of its cash flow from natural gas. More than half was provided by uh, oil and the other natural gas liquids. So the bottom line is that, uh, that the United States uh, is projected to provide over 20% of the global increase of natural gas uh, production. And we should not forget about a very important uh, country just north of the border, Canada. Canada has extremely large gas resources, but actually has, been, uh, actually has experienced a falling gas production because they were squeezed out from the traditional export markets. So without, without a significant export capacity, uh, substantial gas resources in North America, the US and Canada will stay underground forever. Now, uh, at the same time, we also foresee uh, or suppose that the worst days for coal or the b best days for coal, if you look at it from the climate change perspective, uh, are over. Uh, the last year we have seen a, a significant coal to gas switch uh, in the United States, around 200 terawatt hours, which delivered a large carbon dioxide emission reduction. But this very large coal to gas switch uh, relied on really dirt cheap gas. Uh, the reason for this is that whereas the United States has a very, high, very large gas-fired power generation fleet, so, so if you take a look at the nameplate capacities, the potential for coal to gas switch seems limitless. But around half of the gas-fired power generation fleet in the U.S. is open cycle gas turbine, which has low efficiency and relies on a very, very gas price, low gas price to uh, come into production. And also, there are significant geographical barriers. The big clusters of gas-fired power generation capacities are the states of California, uh, Arizona, and Texas. Now, California doesn't have a single coal-fired power plant, so there's no competition between there. Texas is isolated from the rest of the United States. A big difference between gas and electricity is that for gas, the United States does have a properly integrated national pipeline infrastructure. For electricity, the United States doesn't have a national electricity transmission infrastructure. Uh, it has a weak uh, a transmission system which is riddled by bottlenecks and I have not yet met a single uh, energy expert who, who would have been optimistic about the development of the US uh, electricity transmission infrastructure. Uh, so, the, so what we see in the United States is that with the recovery of gas prices, coal is holding its position reasonably well and, 
natural gas captures the growth. So overall, the carbon dioxide emissions in the U.S. power sector go back on a growing path. Now, of course, I'm aware that uh, there might be some important initiatives in U.S. climate policy, and of course, we developed these projections before that. And then I would again make a traditional the reference to Elvis Presley. Is applying the Elvis uh, principle to U.S. climate policy is that, that great song by Elvis, that a little, a little less conversation, a little more action. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, uh, there we did not assume uh, the application of Elvis Presley to U.S. climate policy. Now, now the abundance in North America is in stark contrast with the shortages in the rest of the world. Uh, and that will put the North America as a potential exporter into a very, very interesting position. Because last year we have seen a global decline of LNG supply, which is truly exceptional. And that was not a single disruption which can be repaired. That was a long list of systemic events. Uh, the hardcore security problems in Yemen, Libya, Algeria, and Nigeria, a runaway growth of domestic demand in Egypt, Indonesia, Abu Dhabi, and the depletion of conventional gas reservoirs in uh, Oman, Indonesia, Egypt, uh, and, uh, and Algeria. Uh, and I have to say that there is no, there is no reason to be optimistic about either uh, of this uh, situation. I'm not optimistic about the security situation improving in Yemen. I'm not optimistic about uh, domestic demand slowing down in Egypt uh, and, and so on. So this tightness is very, very likely uh, to continue. Uh, in fact, uh, out there, there is a, there's a significant underutilized LNG capacity. For example, the Egyptian government simply prohibited the use of the Damietta LNG facility. So a $15 billion liquefaction train is standing there idle uh, because of the domestic uh, gas shortages. Uh, now, the cavalry is riding to the rescue, uh, and that's, uh, that's Australia. The good news about Australia is that this is a country where contracts are kept, uh, where the government uh, is not going to confiscate your assets. It's a geopolitically very secure uh, supply. The bad news about Australia is that the projects are located in very remote locations, uh, very high technical difficulties. Uh, the, uh, the most usual news that you hear about Australian uh, LNG projects is project delay and cost overrun. Uh, so this, uh, this is not an easy and this is not a cheap supply. And in fact, around 85% of the future production of these projects is already contracted by major uh, Asia utilities. So there will be little additional spot supply available. Now, the combination of a more positive outlook on North American upstream, the robust position of coal in North America in the absence of future uh, of further climate policies, and the tightness of global energy markets greatly increased the attractiveness and greatly enhanced the competitive position of North America as a potential LNG exporter. Uh, so if I take the, the projects that are in advanced stage of development, and by advanced stage I defined the projects that, are, uh, uh, that, uh, that either already have the approval from the Department of Energy or already signed uh, multi-billion dollar commercial contracts with major buyers, those advanced projects were, uh, would transform the United States into the number three uh, LNG exporter behind Qatar and Australia, and would, be, would represent a supply capability equivalent to a group of several conventional LNG exporters. And uh, I should also uh, emphasize that the United States is not an island. Uh, a lot of the debate about gas exports in Washington is taking place as if the United States was an island, but it, but it is not. Uh, the Canada has a completely integrated gas market with the United States. Um, and in Canada, there is a hundred years tradition of an export-oriented mining industry. Uh, so there is no meaningful debate that uh, commodity exports are good. Uh, so uh, if you let the market economy do its job, most of the, uh, most of the export projects would be located in, in the Gulf Coast uh, of the United States. But you can locate LNG export projects uh, in Canada as well. And in fact, several major companies uh, are working on exactly this. Now, one country which is contributing to the tightness of LNG and the global gas demand growth in general uh, is China. Uh, China up until recently had an, LNG system, has an, had an energy system which was completely dominated by coal. Uh, in fact, the, the structure of Chinese energy use is comparable to uh, the Western countries uh, until the 1950s. Uh, and uh, air quality was absolutely awful in those countries as well. So. The city of London had smogs where several thousand people died from air pollution. 
The city of Pittsburgh had to run the street, li the street lighting in the middle of the day because of the smog. Uh, without natural gas, it would have been impossible to clean uh, the air quality of the major cities uh, of the West. And without natural gas, it would be impossible to clean the major cities of China as well. Now, we believe that the Chinese government is absolutely 100% serious uh, in their determination of improving the air quality of China. I mean, you cannot have uh, on, uh, a rising superpower when you, uh, when you have to use chemical warfare equipment to take a walk in the capital. Uh, that's uh, uh, that, that, that's just something uh, unsustainable. So China is roughly 30% uh, of the global gas demand growth. But gi given, that the, given that the key policy driver is air quality, the structure is slightly different than in the rest of the world. So in the electricity sector, uh, investment in new coal-fired power generation in China still exceeds investment in combined cycle gas turbines by a factor of six. The reason for being is that for a, coal, for a new coal-fired power plant, you can, build, you can build it with ultra supercritical technology. You can apply all the modern uh, environmental control technologies, uh, electrostatic filters, uh, flue gas desulfurization. So you can do a long, long way towards cleaning up a coal-fired power plant. And the new generation Chinese coal-fired power plants are pretty good uh, in this respect. If you want to heat buildings with coal or if you want to use coal in industrial process heat, there is no way to avoid the, the environmental disaster. So the China will... Uh, will use gas in building heating very, very significantly. Interesting enough, if you take the major emerging, country, uh, emerging market countries who drive uh, energy demand growth globally, China is the only one of them which has cold winters and needs winter heating. Indonesia, India, Brazil does not have winter heating. China does. Uh, so so we, we, esti we estimate a new gas heating in around 3.5 million homes every year. Uh, also, roughly 7 million tons of coal uh, replaced by natural gas in industrial processes every year. Uh, so this is a very uh, big gas demand drive. Uh, China actually has a, a growth of gas upstream production, which would be impressive by any other standard than the size and scale of the Chinese energy system. So China is around 15% of the growth of global gas production. They have a nicely growing gas production, but this is nowhere near enough uh, to supply their, uh, their domestic production growth. And another uh, Im interesting thing is that uh, China probably has a lot of shale gas underground, but above ground, they have very serious difficulties to get it out. Uh, in, in general, anything that the Chinese really want uh, and does not contradict the laws of physics moves very rapidly, but shale gas is not moving very rapidly. Even the Chinese government official targets, uh, which the Chinese industry is publicly skeptical about it, uh, but even the official targets would call for a ramp up of shale gas production, which is roughly one third of the speed uh, of, the, uh, of the ramp up of the shale gas industry in the United States. So in general, we got used to the idea of China building everything much more rapidly than uh, what we would be able to in the, in the US. But in the shale gas, the most optimistic case is one third of the US speed. Uh, they have three hot areas uh, for shale gas in China. But if you take a look at these three, Sichuan uh, has an incredibly high population density, several times higher than the population density of the US major shale plays. And the other hot areas, the Ordos Basin in the north and the Tarim Basin in the northwest are deserts uh, where water uh, availability is a very, very uh, big issue. So one, one important sign is that uh, China is investing very seriously in coal gasification. Now, coal gasification is a capital-intensive, energy-intensive, water-hungry and dirty technology. Uh, the, uh, so in every developed market economy, coal gasification was phased out when natural gas arrived. Uh, when China is investing in it heavily today, that tells you a lot uh, about how optimistic they are deep in their heart uh, uh, about shale gas uh, in, in China. So, so with, the, with a very bullish demand growth and a moderate growth of domestic upstream driven by other sources by shale gas, China actually adds uh, the current, current gas imports of Germany uh, to its import needs, uh, so, which is primary two sources, pipeline from Central Asia uh, and LNG. Uh, China absorbs practically 100% of uh, the production growth from Central Asia. Uh, and you know that in the, 
in the city of Brussels, you can have a comf comfortable, well-paid job organizing conferences about how to bring Central Asia and gas to Europe. Uh, that's, that's a complete waste of time. Uh, Europe, Europe completely missed the boat uh, on Central Asia and gas. Uh, you should imagine a gi giant vacuum cleaner on the Chinese border sucking in all the gas uh, from Central Asia. That's, the, that's, that's my mental image uh, of, uh, uh, of that. Uh, and, uh, and on LNG, uh, they will absorb roughly one third of uh, the global increase of LNG supply, which is more than their contracts. So China will be also an important buyer in the spot uh, LNG market. Now, uh, I have not mentioned Russian gas into China. Uh, so that is going to happen, but not this decade, uh, because uh, uh, Russia is talking a lot about redirecting gas exports uh, from Europe to China, but that's uh, easier said than done. That's uh, the, the first observation. And the second is that we should not imagine Russian gas being produced in one definite point in space. The Russian gas resources are scattered in a territory which is bigger than the United States, uh, so some of which is predestined to go to Europe, some of which is predestined to go into China from a geographical point of view. So we should not imagine a big control room in Moscow where they can switch off Europe and switch on China back and forth. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, there are some people in Moscow who would like such a control room, but that's, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, so the, the realistic basis of uh, the Russian exports to China are the East Siberian resources, the Chalangan and Kovitskaya fields. They are located east of the Baikal Lake. Uh, currently, the Russian pipeline system ends uh, at the city of Tomsk in central Siberia, which is still 3,400 kilometers from the Pacific Ocean. So they, they need to develop two supergiant fields, and they need to build several thousand kilometers of pipelines in very, very harsh terrain with very underdeveloped infrastructure. Uh, so even if they agree, uh, which they have not yet, uh, they, uh, so it will take them roughly a decade to develop all these uh, all these projects. A uh, very interesting uh, uh, development took place in Saint Petersburg exactly the time we were, when we were there, is uh, that a Chinese super major uh, company bought into the Yamal LNG project uh, in uh, North Siberia. Uh, this is incredibly interesting from two points of view. One is that Yamal LNG is developed by Novatech. It's not developed by Gazprom. Now, uh, I must say that uh, uh, for a Chinese company making a major investment uh, uh, in Russia, it's difficult to imagine that the choice of partner would go against the wishes of the Russian government. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so this uh, first major strategic Chinese investment in the Russian gas sector is taking place with a partner other than Gazprom. Uh, the other is the, the, the uh, if you read about it in the Russian press, uh, the explanation is that this does not compete with Gazprom because this is LNG. But of course, if China buys more LNG, it's difficult to imagine how it would not have an effect of their appetite for Russian pipeline gas. Uh, and another uh, so interesting characteristic of this project is that this is going to be an Arctic LNG project. Now, Stonewit, the Norwegian uh, LNG project, is called as an Arctic project, uh, but Yamal is much, much more Arctic uh, than Norway. Uh, so the, the geographical and climate conditions are way, way beyond anything uh, the energy in the industry ever done uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so it will be very... It will be very interesting to watch uh, so how the, the technical and, and project, project development challenges are tackled. Now, what we see in Japan is that the past two or three years, Japan was one of the global drivers of gas demand due to Fukushima and the loss of nuclear power. The new Japanese government is very determined to restore nuclear power uh, in Japan, but we don't, we don't foresee nuclear power coming back to the pre-disaster level in the foreseeable future. But even with a moderate restoration of nuclear power, that will be sufficient to stabilize Japanese gas demand because Japan is currently burning large quantities of oil for power generation. So the first nuclear restoration will uh, kick out oil from the power generation sector and stabilize gas as it is. And in Europe, there are some good news and bad news for the gas industry. Uh, the good news is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the, uh, in the past three, three years, the European gas industry faced the perfect storm of a very weak energy demand overall because of the Eurozone crisis, uh, a very low carbon price, which was an indirect consequence of the Eurozone crisis. The Eurozone crisis pushed down European carbon emissions, so there was less demand for carbon quotas. 
expensive gas, cheap coal, and rapidly growing renewables. So every single factor conspired against gas consumption in Europe, and it completely crashed uh, the it completely crashed uh, the European uh, European gas demand, and it also made the business model of gas-fired power generation in Europe borderline impossible. Now I can tell you just a personal example. I'm coming from the I came to the IA from the European oil and gas industry. And my former company uh, made a strategic decision that they cancelled their gas-fired power generation projects in Hungary and Slovakia, but they continued the exploration drilling in the Tal block, which is located in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. Because, uh, because they came to the conclusion, and I fully agree with them, that drilling in Taliban territory is a better risk-return combination than gas-fired power generation uh, in the European Union. Uh, now, uh, now, we see... We see some recovery of this because the large compression plant directive kicks in. You know, in general, if you want to deal with coal and you want to reduce emissions in the power sector, you can have two approaches. One, you put up a high explicit carbon price and you have gas defeating coal on a market basis. Now, if you cannot do that, then the plan B is uh, that you take every single thing that a coal-fired power plant emits, apart from carbon dioxide, and you regulate it to death. You regulate it until, you, until it dies. Uh, and then you will have, uh, have coal-fired power, uh, uh, coal power plants closing down uh, and, and disappearing from the energy mix. And this is what is happening in Europe. Uh, the European Parliament rejected the tightening of the emission trading uh, system, which would have led to a higher carbon price. But the large combustion plant directive is kicking in, uh, which will punish coal-fired power generation quite seriously and lead to a significant uh, decommissioning uh, of coal-fired power generation. And as Europe loses the physical ability to burn the coal, uh, that will lead to declining coal-fired power generation and enable gas to recover. But gas will not recover to the pre-financial crisis level, and the increase in the utilization of gas plants in Europe will only be 3%, so the, the business model will remain very, very challenging. And of course, uh, the gas industry always claims that it would be much, much better and much more cost-efficient for Europe to have a gas-based strategy based on the carbon price. Now, here I compared the actual, uh, the actual structure of power generation in Europe. Nuclear is stable in the two scenarios. Uh, the current one, low gas-fired power generation, a lot of coal and a lot of renewables. And if we run the existing CCGD capacity in Europe in a, with an optimal utilization, we would have a much higher gas-fired power generation. I added just enough coal to have the same carbon dioxide emissions, so we are the same from a climate change point of view, and uh, we would need much less renewables. Now, in the second case, we would save some $27 billion on renewable subsidies every year. We would save another $7 billion on coal imports, uh, but we would have a, we would have a roughly 25% higher gas import uh, into the European economy. And very importantly, Europe is not facing a perfectly competitive gas market where Europe is a price taker. Europe is facing an oligopolistic gas market where currently the very, very weak demand is the most important reason of a structural transformation of gas markets. You know, the major exporters are renegotiating their contracts with the European buyers one by one, providing multi-billion dollar concessions because of the very weak demand. And, I cal and if you calculate it, if the 25% higher gas import would lead to a price increase of just 0.8 dollars per MBTU, uh, then uh, we would actually have a higher total system cost. So, so the renewable policies in Europe are remarkably resilient politically, and one reason for that is that a large proportion of the cost of renewables is actually not paid by the European economy. A large proportion of the cost is paid by Gazprom, Qatar, and the Algerians. Uh, it is the gas exporters uh, who pay for renewables in Europe in the form of uh, a, for a forced transformation of gas markets. Uh, now, on the other hand, the good news from the point of view of gas exporters is that shale gas in Europe is proving to be a disappointment. There is a very systematic political resistance against shale gas in Europe. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the German Brewery Association came f forward with public concerns that hydraulic fracturing might cause a deterioration in the quality of German beer. Now, uh, now, now, believe me, believe me. In Germany, in Germany, you don't want you don't want in a political you don't want to be in a political position when the, when the beer industry is against you. You don't. That's that's not a good idea. Uh, that's not a good idea in Germany. Uh, the in Poland. Uh, Prime Minister Tusk had to, uh, made a, 
a very clear public statement to his environmental ministry, publicly stating that Shilgas development needs an entrepreneurial mindset, and if, if the environmental minister is not able to understand this, that he will have to find someone else uh, who will take care of that. Uh, that. That was a public statement from the prime minister, a highly unusual one, uh, if I might say. But even, even with this very high level dedicated political support from the prime minister himself, the Polish industry is facing the, the problem of, the, of, of ramping up the supply chain for shale production. Uh, if you take the drilling activity in Poland last year and this year combined, that's roughly comparable to the drilling activity in Eagle Ford on an average week. Uh, so Poland is roughly the size of Texas. So if you wanted to have Poland playing roughly the same role as a major shale play in North America, you would have to ramp up the industry's uh, project management capability by a factor of 100. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very, very significant obstacle. Uh, now, another important phenomenon that we looked at is the emerging role of natural gas as a transportation fuel. Now, this is not a new technology. If, uh, you can go to you can go to some very interesting places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Argentina, and you will find natural gas vehicles which are basically 1970s cars uh, converted in some neighborhood garage. Uh, but, uh, but these countries never played uh, a, a major role in determining global oil demand, whereas this time we have very interesting developments in two countries which do play a major role in global oil demand, the United States and China. Uh, of course, if you want to use natural gas in the transportation sector, plan A is to go for a brute force uh, and build a gas to liquid plant, uh, plant uh, uh, where the advantage is that you provide uh, very high quality liquid fuels which can be used in the existing transport infrastructure without any modification. The bad news is that it's a very capital intensive project. Uh, the PER GTR project in Qatar started as a $5 billion project and it was completed as a $22 billion project. Uh, with a $17 billion cost overrun. Chances are that you will experience some, some project management issues. You lose over one third of the gas uh, because it's a very in energy intensive process. So gas to liquids uh, is a technology for, for places where you have very large amounts of capital and very large amount of gas at the same time. Now Qatar is such a place, uh, but there are not all that many such places uh, around there. So we are more optimistic about the direct use of natural gas in the transportation sector than about gas to liquids. And there uh, you have two technology pathways. One is, is compressed natural gas, which is reasonably easy to compress the gas and the infrastructure is not uh, a big deal. Uh, but compressed natural gas is suitable for personal vehicles where you would need a very, very wide coverage uh, or for local transportation. The holy grail is using LNG in heavy duty transportation either heavy trucking or in railroads, where the, the potential is the sky. The heavy duty transportation in uh, diesel fuel demand is actually bigger than the gasoline demand uh, of, uh, of personal transportation. So there you, have, you could have a very large impact on oil consumption, but uh, liquefying the gas is far more difficult than compressing it. Uh, so the fuel uh, distribution infrastructure uh, is more difficult. And there we took a look at this, these two key countries, uh, the United States and China is the other one. Uh, in the United States, what we see is that this decade will be primarily about rolling out the infrastructure, which is still missing. The United States currently has over, over 100,000 gasoline stations and roughly 1,000 of them sell CNG. And as a result, despite of the shale gas revolution in, in full swing, last year only 15,000 CNG cars were sold uh, in the United States in a car market of 15 million uh, because people are concerned that they will not be able to fill up their cars. But uh, there is an increasing market share for CNG in public transportation and in public deliveries, where you have the, uh, the, uh, the multiply advantages of the easiness of the CNG infrastructure and well-predictable routes and high utilization rates. On heavy-duty transportation, now all the major truck manufacturers offer uh, LNG models, and some of them offer also dual models, which can, which can run on diesel fuel and bypass the infrastructure barriers. Uh, several companies are working on really large investments into the refilling infrastructure, and we also see interesting technological R&D on, on the refilling and storage and large, uh, small scale compression, small scale liquefaction. Uh, and, uh, and we are watching the U.S. railroads uh, very carefully, because there you have, uh, there you could have individual corporate decisions leading to a very sizable, uh, very sizable impact. So the bottom line is that. 
in the next five years, we project 120,000 barrels per day oil replaced by natural gas uh, in the United States, which, uh, which means that by the end of the five-year period, natural gas will uh, eat a bit more than 1% of U.S. gas production. So still, there is plenty of gas uh, for, for that. But more importantly, the next five years, we'll see a rollout of the infrastructure on the basis of this, uh, this the long-term uh, uh, potential could be much, much bigger than that. Now, in China, uh, despite the increasing import dependency of China and the difficulties of ramping up shale gas production, actually the growth of natural gas as, the transport, as a transportation fuel in China is much, much bigger than in the United States. Uh, and uh, the most important reason for this, that with a natural gas uh, engine, you achieve a roughly 10% reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. So from a climate change point of view, it's nice to have, but it doesn't save the world. Uh, but you achieve a co almost complete elimination of particulate emissions and an almost complete elimination of the sulfur dioxide emissions of diesel engines. Uh, and you do that in an urban environment. So if, uh, uh, so if urban air quality is the key concern and, if, and, and your, the perception is that urban air pollution is out of control, the natural gas vehicles is a very good uh, tool, and China is prepared to go for it even with import dependency. Another uh, important thing is that, as I mentioned, public transportation is a low-hanging fruit for natural gas as a transportation fuel. Now, unfortunately, public transportation does not play a very major role in the United States. Uh, but it plays a very, very big role in China because China did not develop the suburban car commuting lifestyle that the United States has. So the, the market for mass transit buses in China is four times bigger than in the United States. Uh, and consequently, you can have very large individual consumers. So last year, the United States sold uh, 1,600 CNG buses. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, the Beijing City Authority ordered 3,500 uh, in, in one contract, more than twice as much as the US market. Uh, so there is, uh, so there's, a, there's a scope for a big bank approach. And last but not least, China is developing its gas infrastructure right now. So they are building around 5,000 kilometers of gas pipelines every year. Uh, and the Chinese are rolling out the pipeline infrastructure and the vehicle refilling infrastructure simultaneously. Uh, and this is a very effective uh, project development. So all in all, uh, if I add together the United States, China, and some other uh, interesting countries, uh, the growth of natural gas as the transportation fuel uh, does more to reduce oil demand growth than biofuels and electric cars combined. Uh, and then another important difference is that for us, biofuel policies globally is a thousand billion dollar subsidy commitment. Uh, and for electric cars as well, you have to provide very large subsidies for consumers to buy them. Uh, for natural gas, this is primarily driven by the cost efficiency and cost advantages of natural gas. So this is uh, the story of our gas outlook, and I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Laszlo. Um, very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, you come at a very uh, auspicious moment uh, today as a, the president is rolling out his uh, new climate um, strategy. And uh, one of the questions I had in the work that you've been doing is well, a question that has come up repeatedly in things we've looked at in terms of unconventional gas development in the U.S. is methane releases. And I was wondering to what extent you've had a chance to look at that question and the work that you've been, been doing so far um, on the gas outlook. And do you foresee um, other countries starting to move on the issue of contro controlling methane releases as a part of their gas development process? Yes, yes uh, uh, in, in, indeed, uh, uh, this, this was investigated in great detail in, in the Golden Rules for Natural Gas uh, uh, report, uh, report last year, uh, where we estimated that given the brutal green greenhouse gas impact of methane, uh, if you lose more than 1.52% of gas uh, in leakage, uh, that completely kills uh, the climate policy advantages of, of natural gas. Now, uh, 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 and in this respect, shale gas is is worse than the well-managed conventional projects. You can have you can have significant methane leakage from badly managed conventional projects, mm -hmm. uh, but but the shale gas technology is inherently more susceptible uh, for methane leakage because of the fracking uh, uh, techniques. Uh, having said that, uh, our conclusion was that uh, with uh, with 
with good upstream operations, uh, the, it is possible to keep methane leakage under the critical, ter uh, critical threshold. Uh, and we are not talking about science fiction technologies. Uh, we are talking about good old-fashioned upstream, uh, uh, up upstream management. Uh, so this is something that the industry knows how to do it. Uh, but in certain cases, you need regulations and you need uh, economic incentives for them to do it. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, you, you might also be aware that, that last week, uh, the World Energy Outlook uh, published a major report on climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, where, they, uh, where we recommended four major steps uh, to keep alive the hope uh, for decarbonization, one of which is a significant reduction of gas flaring for two reasons. Because gas flaring is a big carbon dioxide source in itself, and second, with gas flaring, you never burn all the gas. You, you have some methane leaking uh, with the burning process. Uh, and there, uh, the, the biggest... Uh, uh, the biggest gas flaring is taking place uh, in, in Nigeria, Iraq, uh, and Russia. Uh, there, the, the Russian government uh, has some very tough policies uh, of reducing gas flaring, uh, but, uh, uh, but of course you have to enforce uh, those policies. In Russia, uh, in Russia, our view is that the key is uh, the third party access to the Russian pipeline system. Because if you can, if you can, if you can take your gas to do, no, if you can take your gas to the European mm -hmm. part of Russia to the major cities, that actually it has a value, uh, and uh, you you provide the incentive to eliminate flaring. In Iraq, uh, the key is uh, to utilize the gas. Now, the good news is that Iraq has a terrible electricity shortage, uh, so they actually have a very strong incentive uh, to reduce gas flaring and burn it for power generation. Uh, for 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 Nigeria, I would be hard pressed to to, to tell a quick good news. <laughs> uh, terrific, thanks. Um, and before I turn it over to the to the audience for questions, the other question, the other issue that comes up here with great frequency is how long can the differential regional pricing structure continue to exist? Uh, many say that it. The U.S. gas inter being introduced globally is going to make it go away very fast, while others say the system of contracts, long-term contracts, uh, and differentiated prices has got much deeper roots and has lasts much longer. So any thoughts on that question? Yes. Uh, we don't we, uh, in a baseline case, we don't foresee an emergence of a single global price for gas. Uh, the uh, natural gas is far more infrastructure dependent than oil. So for for oil, after every dollar invested in oil upstream, uh, on average, you have to spend three dollars in oil infrastructure and in pipelines or oil tankers, ports, uh, that sort of things. In natural gas, this is 42 cents. So after, after every dollar of uh, upstream investment, you need 42 cents invested in gas pipelines, LNG facilities, and so on. So there is still a very, very large upstream investment need, but the proportional importance of infrastructure is uh, more than 10 times bigger. And this infrastructure dependency and this capital intensive nature of the infrastructure will always hinder uh, the, the development of a genuinely global uh, gas market. Uh, having said that, we, we believe that North American exports will play a very important role in, in linking uh, the various gas markets and providing a more flexible, more market-based pricing structure. Okay, well, let me open it up for questions from the floor. We just have a, a couple of rules. One, please identify yourself um, when you're um, asking your question, and then secondly, if your question can be, it can be a comment, but if you can end with a question in terms of the uh, comment that you're making, that would be, be quite helpful. So uh, please, uh, see some hands. Start right here. Uh, Hussein Ibn Yusuf, International Petroleum Enterprises. Thank you so much for the um, very informative presentation. Uh, I have two quick comments and then a uh, question on the slide where you have the LNG uh, providers and so on. Um, on the, uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, problems in Poland and Germany as far as shale gas is concerned, uh, but also in France, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, nuclear lobby is very strong and uh, against the shale gas development. So that's a, a major factor for development of, of uh, shale gas in in, in that part of the world. On the CNG, uh, the, uh, on the transportation side, um, there is a medium ground that you did not mention. Uh, you're absolutely right. The excuse is the, uh, the uh, high cost of the, uh, the, the infrastructure, infrastructure development. 
but the middle ground is the fleet um, where there is a tremendous amount of usage where you don't need uh, you know so many uh, thousands of gas stations or uh, CNG stations there so uh, but the questions on the uh, slides that you have you talked about the problems in Yemen and Egypt and Algeria and so on you were absolutely right but you started with Russia on the top and Oman on the bottom Russia BP has recently downgraded the reserves of natural gas in Russia and I was wondering if that would change your projections, forecasts, and, and views on Russia. And Oman has been uh, having major problems with the reserves. Uh, Shell was forced to downgrade uh, or downsize the reserves several years ago, and, and they really don't have the reserves base to support any kind of development or major development for the LNG. So with all those in mind, how do you see the, uh, the position, and, and, and one final thing that was linked to that is the position of Japan. You talked about uh, China's problem, you know, securing gas from Russia, but there is a competition between Japan and, Russia and, uh, and China for the export of uh, Russian gas. Could you please cut, kind of put it in context? You covered lots of ground, and I, I, I decided to limit my questions and comment on that one slide on the LNG. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, uh, if I can respond first, the, the CNG, you are, you are absolutely right on the fleet, uh, uh, on the fleet vehicles, uh, and we did incorporate that into our projections. Uh, so there, uh, the uh, things like delivery trucks, uh, public transport, and so on. Uh, and I say that, that, that this uh, 120,000 barrels per day uh, oil demand reduction, that's, that's quite sizable in five years, uh, because uh, uh, because those vehicles, uh, uh, so, so th th those vehicles are not the largest part of oil consumption. The largest part of oil consumption is personal vehicles for gasoline and heavy-duty truck trucking uh, for uh, uh, for uh, gas. But even with the even with the hundred thousand barrels per day, I must say that we are considerably more bullish than the Energy Information Administration for the United States in, in gas in transportation. Uh, the and as your 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 uh, question on on, uh, on on LNG, uh, you know the the concept of a proven reserve is something which can be produced economically uh, with the given technology. So it has a it has an economic and the and the technology part. Now, of course, we should ask uh, we should ask BP of what is truly behind this downgrade. But in the case of in the case of Russia, uh, any. Uh, in our view, is that any any downgrade is very very clearly because of the uh, evolving economics rather than uh, rather than uh, than geology. So, for example, the the Stockman field, which is alone uh, uh, over 3,000 billion cubic meters reserves, so it's like more than one big share play uh, in North America. Uh, Stockman is put on hold indefinitely because there the original business model would have been to export the gas to uh, to the United States, and that's not going to happen. Uh, so, uh, so there is there is very little doubt that Russia has the ability to increase its gas production very significantly uh, from the current level if the markets are there. Currently, they are constrained by uh, by weak demand in Europe. And also weak demand in Russia itself, where energy efficiency is so bad that it has only one direction to go. Uh, so, uh, so without the development of large-scale Russian gas exports to the Asia-Pacific, uh, an awful lot of Russian gas will stay underground forever. Sultan with the Energy Intelligence Group. What's your view of uh, U.S. LNG export policy? Do you know what the policy is? Because I don't. Uh, how many? How many? Uh, how many projects will be approved? Will it be two years? Will it be 20 years? What's What's your view? Well, I, I, I read I read with a great interest the study of the Department of Energy and NERA on the on the economics and welfare impact of U.S. Uh, LNG exports. I, I'm I'm an economist by by training and. My, my recollection is that ever since David Ricardo analyzed the trade of wine and textiles between England and Portugal 200 years ago, there has been a 200 years old uh, professional consensus in economics that removing artificial trade barriers is improving social welfare. <laughs> so I was, 
I was very relieved. I was very relieved that the Department of Energy did not overturn 200 years of economic consensus because I would have had to throw away my degree. Uh, the, uh, so, so the conclusion, so, so the conclusion, uh, their conclusion was that uh, the uh, uh, that approving such projects is uh, is improving uh, is, uh, is improving welfare. Now, I, I must say two two things which I find very very. Uh, illuminating in the debate about uh, uh, about U.S. Uh, LNG exports. As one is that a lot of debate, a lot of this debate in Washington is taking place as if the United States was an island, uh, completely neglecting Canada. Uh, so, uh, if the objective is that you want to redirect uh, investment into the Pacific coast of Canada instead of the Gulf coast of Mexico, that you can achieve uh, by prohibiting project development uh, in the Gulf coast of Mexico. Another interesting thing is that the that uh, you can have, uh, you know, you, you can have uh, uh, exports without any limitation to countries which have a free trade agreement uh, uh, with the United States. Uh, that actually includes uh, Singapore, uh, which is working very hard to develop uh, an LNG trading hub and uh, very uh, has very interesting initiatives with that. So I can tell you that if the policy will be that you can legally export gas from the United States to Singapore, but you cannot export it to Japan, then after my IEA, I will move to Singapore, set up an LNG trading business, and make some real money. Uh, uh, so there is a, I mean, there is a, there's a very, very rich history of such policy restrictions uh, meeting the ingenuity of energy traders uh, and, and, uh, and completely failing. So, so the bottom line is that uh, on that uh, the up until the economics is there, uh, and we believe that the economics is there, uh, you either force that gas staying underground, uh, or that gas will get out because the because the the, the non-commercial gas resources of the of, of the United States and Canada combined is considerably bigger than any meaningful demand uh, uh, in these two countries. Raisa Ibihina, CSS, uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I have two questions, one about Russia and one about China. Uh, as for Russia, you mentioned prospects of Russia redirecting its exports from Europe to Asia. Uh, I'm more interested in domestic consumption and what your estimates are uh, on this Russia government's new policy on uh, developing uh, gas uh, utilization in transportation. And the question about China, um, you mentioned several ways to utilize, to, to switch from coal to gas in China. And I'm just interested um, in which sector, in industry or in transportation or in power generation, the switch from coal to gas may have the biggest impact on reduction of CO2 emissions and particles emissions. Thank you. Well, uh, gas, I mean, gas in transport in Russia makes just perfect sense. Because uh, on the gas side, uh, they, their key concern is that there, some of their gas might stay underground forever because of the lack of markets. Uh, and it's not easy and not cheap to get it to Asia. On the oil side, uh, actually, the, the Russian oil industry will find it very, very challenging to maintain the current export levels. Uh, because their brownfield production is now depleting and their new, their, 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 their new oil prospects are very, very difficult. So. Uh, so heating the domestic oil demand in Russia by using the excess natural gas uh, and releasing more oil for exports, it makes just perfect sense. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, we still don't see very detailed policies and very detailed projects uh, ongoing on this, uh, this field. So, so this is something that we, we, we understand that the Russian government has a preference for it. I, I agree with it, but the implementation uh, is something that we, we still uh, see. Let's see. Now, on uh, in 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 China, I think the uh, I think the most uh, important contribution of gas is is in the buildings sector and in the uh, in the industrial sector. You know, if you take coal utilization in the United States, 97 percent of the coal in the U.S. economy is used in power generation and steel making. You know, these are the modern 21st century uses uh, of coal. Uh, in China, these two industries represent only 75% of the Chinese coal use. 25% of Chinese coal, and this is 25% of a very, very large number, uh, 
uh, is used in 19th century type applications. I mean, the city of Beijing burns 15 million tons of coal every winter. I mean, no wonder the air quality is so awful. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so on the electricity side, the Chinese have a track record of building large hydropower plants and nuclear power plants on budget, on time. Uh, they heavily invest in, uh, in other renewables as well, so they have a set of technological options uh, in, uh, in electricity. Uh, but for, for building heating and industrial applications, there is no technological alternative to gas. So that, that, will, be the, that will be the first driver. Now, if, if natural gas makes it big in the Chinese electricity sector, the sky would be the limit. But we actually project that, uh, that renewables and nuclear power combined will play an almost three times bigger role in reducing Chinese coal-fired power generation growth than natural gas. Following up a little bit on the point about freeing up um, the fuel oil in, in Russia for, for export, you made a comment at, right at the beginning that I think is uh, very important to talk about the Middle East, about the abundance underground and the shortage above uh, above ground, and I was wondering if you'd like to spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about what the impediments are to being able to develop a rational regional approach. I mean, history is probably one of the most important. I think uh, um, in a discussion we had earlier, you mentioned one example that I think really highlights the problems of a LNG cargo shipping from Qatar to Louisiana and turning around and going back to Kuwait as a way for Qatar gas to get to Kuwait, which if you're familiar with the geography is not a very long distance between the two countries. So I was wondering if you'd uh, maybe spend a minute on that. And then the other uh, issue that receives a lot of attention here is East African gas discoveries. A lot of interest in these huge de uh, deposits off Mozambique, Tanzania. But I notice in your presentation, at least in something with five year time frame. You, did, you don't mention them much, yeah. and that may be the conclusion, but yeah. if you talk well, a little bit. I would say with a, with a bit of a simplification, in a typical Middle Eastern country, the natural gas situation is, is the following, that you have, uh, uh, you have plenty of gas upstream opportunities at, let's say, a four or $5 per MBTU cost level. Uh, you, have a natural, you have a national oil and gas monopoly, you might or might not have foreign investment in the gas upstream, but if you have foreign investment in the gas upstream, then you will have to sell your gas to the natural oil and gas monopoly at a regulated price, which is, let's say, typically $2 per MBTU. Uh, so, you have, you are, so you have plenty of upstream opportunities which the investors would not touch uh, the, because the regulated uptake price is too low. Then that, natural, then that national uh, oil monopoly, which is more often than not state-owned, will sell the gas at a $2 price to the national, again, usually state-owned, electricity monopoly, uh, which given that it gets dirt cheap gas, uh, will, burn only, will burn the gas and uh, will not care much about power, power generation efficiency either. And the, the, uh, and the national oil monopoly suffers a big loss Either it's a direct financial loss or it's an opportunity cost, but everything is cost-financed and paid by the oil exports. Uh, and up until you have a $100 per barrel oil price paying for everything, uh, no one will care. Uh, so uh, so this, is, this is the stylized model of the, of the gas policy of a typical Middle Eastern country. And the same country uh, usually have an, an, up, uh, an export value of gas, so if you could export it, at $10 per MBTU. Uh, so, so at the export value, the upstream would, would flourish because you have plenty of upstream opportunities that would make sense at the export value. Uh, and also on the electricity side as well, if you combine the recent uh, improvements of the cost efficiency of solar power with the sunshine of the Middle East, uh, at, the, at the export value of gas in most Middle Eastern countries, solar power is actually in the money without a single cent of subsidies uh, today. Uh, so you would have, uh, uh, so with a proper, with a market-based policy, you would have a much bigger investment in gas upstream, and you, be ha you will have a, you will have an uptake of solar power without any subsidies. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'm not very optimistic about the institutional requirements uh, because uh, because the current situation is is rather comfortable with most stakeholders, and the hundred dollars per barrel oil price pays for it anyway. 
Uh, now, on, on, on East Africa, uh, so I, I tried to keep the presentation short, uh, so that's why I didn't have a dedicated slide uh, to it. Uh, but you're absolutely right that, the, that this, is a, this is a very, very big uh, discovery. We are talking about our, our, our reserve base, which is roughly equivalent to 80 to 100 years worth of U.S. shale gas production. Uh, so, so very, very sizable. Uh, now, uh, also, it's, uh, uh, also there's a very, very strong interest of the major Asian utilities. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Japanese were ahead of the Chinese, so Mitsui was there significantly before the Chinese showed up. Uh, when the Chinese decided to show up, they showed up with a big sack of money, uh, uh, making a very uh, significant mm -hmm. uh, acquisition. Uh, the uh, developing now developing that gas uh, will will take uh, an investment wave comparable to what Qatar did uh, in the past decade. Uh, but uh, and that, that's where the challenge lies lies because Qatar played their cards very very well. So they had a they had a they have a very they have a very professional very fu very well functioning national uh, oil company Qatar Petroleum who was a joint venture partner in the LNG projects and they opened up the investment environment so all the usual suspects ExxonMobil Shell uh, Total are there in Qatar uh, big time uh, and this is how you can develop uh, East Africa as well uh, but these are these are countries where the institutional development is in a very very early stage. So you, you see that as something significant in the post-2020 yes. period. Yes. yes. Question there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David Lewis with Manchester Trade. Can you mention anything about the U.S. neighbor to the south on oil and gas in terms of that partnership, since you mentioned Canada in the north? Thank you. Yes, uh, in Mexico, Mexico has uh, some of the best shale resources in the world from a geological point of view. Uh, you know, Eagle Ford is just at the Mexico-Texas Mexico border. No one believes that the geology stops uh, at the border. Uh, unfortunately, also in Mexico, uh, it's written into the Constitution that oil and gas production is a state monopoly, and the anniversary of that constitutional change is a national holiday. Uh, so, uh, so the so the policy barriers for, for, for large-scale foreign investment in the Mexican oil and gas sector are quite formidable, and we don't assume, we don't assume a big change there. Now, Mexico has uh, a state uh, oil and gas company, Pemex, uh, which uh, uh, up until today uh, has not moved into shale uh, plays uh, significantly. Uh, so, the, so I would say that our baseline projection is that Mexico Mexico imports significant quantities of gas from the United States on pipeline, and shale gas in Mexico stays on the ground. Uh, and, uh, and you would need a very significant change in government policies in Mexico for us to, to, to change that projection. Matt. Okay, uh, Matt Willis, EDF Trading. What explains the differentiation between oil field services in North America and the rest of the world? Is this, are these issues of human capital or technological issues related to the drilling rigs or, or something else? No, it's, uh, I, I think the most important factor of this is uh, 100 years of history. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, in the first, I mean, in the first 50 years of the industry, uh, the United States was more than half of global oil production. And in the second 50 years of the industry, it still had a very, very large onshore industry. I mean, Europe has a sizable oil and gas production, but almost all of that is offshore, where you have, a, where you, in, in offshore, you have a small number of large and complicated projects. Uh, where are, so Europe never had the equivalent of the, of the small size independence by cutting all around North America. That's, that's North, American, uh, North American specialty. So the, 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 today, the only country uh, which has, uh, uh, for historical reasons, a very strong oil field service industry onshore is, uh, is Russia. Uh, and, and, the Russian, uh, and the Russian gas upstream is actually uh, becoming to be similar to the North American in a sense that a group of, of independent companies like Novatec are moving into very interesting opportunities, taking advantage of, uh, 
of uh, the financial advantage of, of, of liquids, uh, uh, looking at tight oil uh, and so on. Uh, potentially, China has the capability to develop uh, an oil field service industry uh, so, so like this, uh, and I believe they will, uh, but even for the Chinese, it will take a decade. But in, in Europe, I'm not, I'm not optimistic at all. I mean, I have, again, in my previous job, we, we did a serious effort on, on developing uh, non-commercial gas in Eastern Europe. Uh, and we had to charter a cargo plane to fly in heavy equipment from Houston one by one for every test drill because there was not a single piece of the equipment in Europe. Uh, so, so I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic about the upswing in Europe. So just to follow on a second, d does that in your mind mean that the gas gets left in the ground or takes longer to develop? Now, some, some of the gas uh, might stay underground. So for example, the French government has a, a ban on shale development full stop. Now up until that, up until that uh, policy stays in place, uh, the gas stays underground. Now, the, but actually uh, uh, a number of European countries did not ban shale gas, but they have policies in place which are functionally equivalent of banning it. So for example, when you, my country, Hungary, when you need a several months long of environmental licensing for every single fracking frack job. Uh, with this policy, it's just impossible to do the, uh, the intensive moss production, which you need to develop a major share play. Uh, so this is, this is practically equivalent of the uh, government banning it. Uh, but, e but, but, but even if you had uh, all the European governments coming down for a strong political support, so you just based everything on the fundamental geology, which is more difficult than the United States, uh, shale gas in Europe would, would always be much, much more expensive than in the United States. Chances are that shale gas, uh, sh chances are that US shale gas liquefied and shipped to Europe would be cheaper than shale gas produced in Europe. Mm. Uh, but uh, shale gas in Europe would still have a fighting chance uh, against the conventional import contracts, which are very expensive. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, thank you very much for very comprehensive. This is usually expected from OEA throughout the years that I have been in contact with. Well, this is Moses Shirazi. Uh, Senior gas specialist, uh, of course, retired World Bank. Uh, in your presentation, under one of the slides, you mentioned that with U.S. market uh, saturated, right? So historically, uh, we know that uh, the share of gas in the energy mix in the U.S. has reached 30 percent, and in some countries even higher, like let's say in the Netherlands, to 57 percent. Uh, and uh, so on that basis, uh, I believe the share of gas uh, presently in, in the U.S. is uh, well below the 30 percent. And uh, worldwide, is it something like 22 percent now? Yeah. So what is your uh, forecast uh, for the worldwide trend in the U.S., uh, worldwide trend, U.S., or is any country in the world who has uh, surpassed, let's say, the uh, Netherlands or being very successful in that trend? That uh, you, there, you have to have, you have to make very careful, com very careful uh, uh, comparisons on two structural factors. One is the one is the share of the different sectors of the economy in energy consumption, and there, for example, the United States is very different from the Netherlands which is a small, densely populated country with a brilliant public transport and railroad system. So, uh, so the, the, the role of the transportation sector in, in the energy demand is unusually high in the United States because of the, because of the, because of the car-based transportation system. So, so in the United States, uh, up until oil remains dominant in the transportation sector, oil will have always have a very high share uh, in the, uh, or, or up until the Americans start to use public transportation, which is, doesn't seem to be very likely. Uh, the, uh, so the, uh, so, so that, so this is why, this is why we are looking at uh, gas in the U.S. transportation sector very, very carefully. Uh, 
Uh, now the other uh, thing uh, which can make a big difference is the share is the structure of the electricity system where the where the share of gas can go from almost zero in Poland to uh, almost 100 percent in certain states uh, in the former Soviet Union uh, depending on uh, policies history and, and and national decisions and there the there what we see in the is that the in the United States, the, the, US, the existing U.S. nuclear fleet still has a good 15 to 20 years to go. Uh, we don't see much investment in new nuclear in the United States, so, so the long-term future of nuclear is uncertain, but, but in the next 15, 20 years, the existing fleet is in a good shape. Coal in the United States is, is remarkably resilient unless you do something to kick it out. So the... So in the, in, the, I, I, in the absence of some dedicated policy, which can either be a carbon price or can be some other uh, environmental regulation to constrain the operations of coal-fired power plants, uh, in the absence of that, uh, uh, the, the United States has some of the cheapest and the core resources in the, in the Powder River Basin, which would be very, very difficult to beat. Uh, so. So this, these two factors, the very high role of transportation sector and the very strong market competitiveness of coal, uh, will mean that a high share of gas in the U.S. energy mix uh, means a different number than, than it would mean for the Netherlands, for example. And I, I think we're going to hear today that uh, the, the efforts towards that second half of your comments on the coal, not the price, but the regulatory approach. I think we had another question here. Jeff Price with Blue Wave Resources. We were talking about European supply uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the one country that does seem to be moving ahead with shale gas is the UK. They're already producing, they already have some producing shale gas wells. The British Geological Survey estimates that they have substantial reserves. That's one area of potential uh, increase. Another area of potential supply for Europe uh, would be the Levant Basin. Uh, which gets you into Israel, Lebanon, Cyprus, and all the geopolitics that that uh, entails. What do you think is going to happen in those two uh, uh, areas? Well, the, the, I mean, the UK, I mean, the UK gas industry is, is very, very active in producing uh, consultant reports and Financial Times editorials, uh, much, much less active in actual drilling activity. Uh, so, so it's a grand total of two shale gas drilling rigs are operating uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, for them, it will take a couple of hundred years uh, to get to the production level of a major U.S. shale play. Uh, so now, uh, I, I don't want to be unfair because the U.K. is the is the only country where the government policy is moving towards the right direction uh, in terms of letting development go ahead. Uh, so there, so so in the UK now, it's up to the industry to make it happen. But uh, but still, uh, the, the 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 gap between the project developments uh, should not be underestimated. Uh, then uh, the yes, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, well, I can I can tell you that in in this report there was uh, several hours of consultation with various lawyers uh, on every line on the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, because when you combine. Uh, when you combine the Cyprus-Turkey relationship with the Israel-Lebanon relationship, uh, there is even a gas discovery on uh, voters which, belo which would belong to the Gaza Strip uh, if uh, Palestine uh, was an independent state. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really a remarkable uh, web of, of geopolitical sensitivities. Uh, now, uh, having said that, the region actually has a 3,000 years tradition of sorting out political hostilities if there is a lot of money on the table. Uh, so the, <laughs> uh, and there is a lot of money on the table. So, so, uh, so again, this, these developments will, will eventually go ahead, uh, but we will, see, we will see still a lot of adventures before, before the happy end. Question in the back. Vecislav Petrushka, Embassy of Moldova. Which countries from the Central and Eastern European Central and Eastern European countries and also from the like, um, Soviet Union, do you expect it to be among the first importers of the LNG gas from the U.S.? 
uh, what are the major obstacles along this way, and uh, what is the expected framework to, to achieve okay, this objective? Thank you. Okay. We don't, we don't expect uh, LNG imports in, in southeastern Europe. Uh, so there, Greece has uh, already existing LNG terminal. Uh, there was a project idea in, in Croatia, another one in Ukraine, but none of that seems to be credible for me. Uh, so I spent several years from my life working on the Croatian uh, LNG uh, project and that made me deeply skeptical. Uh, what, what, what we see much more interesting is uh, uh, that the existing LNG facilities in Europe are running at a roughly 50% capacity utilization uh, because of the weak demand. Uh, so you can have, if, if additional LNG supply is available, you can have very large quantities of LNG delivered into Europe on the existing capacities. And then the question is whether Europe already has a properly functioning single market, because if it does, then it doesn't really matter where the LNG is entering to. And there the development is, is remarkably uh, remarkable. Uh, one, uh, one, one taste of things to come was Croatia, where the long-term contract between Croatia and Gazprom ran out uh, in 2011. The traditional way of handling such situations in Eastern Europe would have been for the Prime Minister to fly to Moscow and sign up a, to a, long, a new long-term contract. Instead, Croatia opened uh, uh, an open competitive tender for gas supplies, which gas from lost, uh, and ENI uh, won it. ENI has a diversified uh, international portfolio of various gas sources, and ENI is supplying Croatia from its diverse international portfolio. Or right now, for example, there are two pipelines crossing the Ukraine-Hungary border, uh, bringing in the Russian gas imports. The import needs are lower because of the weak demand. So actually one of the, one of the pipelines was physically, de deliver, physically rebuilt for a re reverse flow operation. So currently one pipeline is bringing in Russian gas to Hungary and the other pipeline is bringing gas back from the European market physically to Ukraine. Uh, so uh, we are not yet there. So the, the, but, but the progress towards a genuinely integrated single market in Europe is, is much better than I would, what I would have expected a couple of years ago. And once you have a single market, you don't need to build new LNG facilities in Europe, probably ever. So one last question that I, I was going to ask, and it is related to the regional pricing question, but there's a lot of debate as to whether <laughs> the emergence of Henry Hub type pricing with U.S. exports will mean the, the death of the long-term oil priced uh, contract. So we'll let you have that one as the last question. Yes. It's not the death. It's, 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 not, the, it's not the death because, uh, uh, because the LNG is very capital intensive. Uh, it's a very reasonable requirement for the project developers to have investment security. And on the other side of the contract, the major Asia utilities tend to value long-term strategic relationships. So I wouldn't expect them to walk away from contracts. Uh, having said that, uh, it would put a pressure on the existing business model. So, uh, so and I, I have a feeling that the industry is a bit complacent uh, about, uh, uh, about Asia uh, in this respect because uh, uh, because there will be there will be market developments, there will be uh, other gas sources. It's not going to be it's not going to be we, we wake up one day and oil prices station is gone, but still there will be competition uh, between the projects. So uh, having your project, uh, you know, be, being an investor in the most expensive LNG projects uh, pro project where your only where your only uh, prospect of recovering your capital investment is an oil price index contract running for 25 years uh, is, is not necessarily a good strategy position. So it's, it's, always, good, it's, it's always good to have uh, a cost-efficient cost <laughs> project. Well, please join me in thanking Laszlo for a great presentation this afternoon. <laughs>